the uh, let's go to the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament, part of the Pentateuch, as you know, uh, the third book in our Bible, Genesis, Exodus, then Leviticus, and uh, turn there to chapter 23. And as we continue to note Jesus' Passion Week and now his apocalyptic discourse called the Olivet Discourse, uh, we understand the prophecies that he was making in regard to his second advent that bring us into that tribulational time period which is a small seven-year time frame uh, that will uh, be at the conclusion of the age of the church uh, prior to the millennial reign of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And during this time is that great time of the Antichrist coming onto the scene and trying to establish world rule and world government along with a world religion worshiping him. But as you know, all of that will fail, just as all evil eventually does fail and be shown for naught. And during that tribulational time, at the end, uh, we will see our Lord return and we will come with him victoriously and therefore wiping out evil uh, and uh, having the tactical victory over sin and evil based on the strategic victory that Jesus Christ won at the cross. But within that time period, there are many different types of judgments. We're noting the seven sealed judgments, the fourth being the judgment of death. According to what we're noting in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verse 11, that has led us into the uh, fourth seal judgment, which is the judgment of death coming on to the world, uh, where that horse rider is named death and has the companion along with him called Hades. And death and Hades are given power to uh, kill one-fourth of planet Earth during that time by sword, by famine, by death or pestilence, and by wild beast. And so therefore there will be a horrific death uh, during that time period like the world has never seen. So in regard to that false seal judgment, we've been noting the different analogies. We've noted numerologies, the word seals in Revelation 5, the living creatures, the tribes of Israel. And we've noted the fourth in each of those categories. We've noted the color, uh, this yellowish green, the ashen uh, pale color as it sometimes is uh, translated. We've noted the seven messages to the seven churches, the fourth to the church at Thyatira. We've noted the sevenfold praise in Revelation 5.12 and the fourfold praise in verse 13 that give us two aspects of who Jesus Christ is, having the might and dominion for rule and authority. We noted the seven days of creation and their analogy, along with the seven results of the baptism of God the Holy Spirit, the fourth being positional sanctification that the believer receives, that the world rejects. Then we've noted the seven trials of Jesus Christ, the fourth before Pontius Pilate. And then we also noted the seven sayings of Jesus Christ on the cross, my God, my God, the fourth one, why have you forsaken me? And the various emphasis there. Because these things represent the person and work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as according to the plan of God the Father for our salvation, because the world has rejected these things, it is a reason why these judgments come into the world during the tribulational time period. But also with the understanding that God is giving one last gasp or effort in regard to bring salvation to those whose hearts are hardened towards Jesus Christ. And our last analogy that we've been noting now, and this is our third uh, night on this, and I promise I'll finish it up tonight. I should never promise, okay? But in any case, the seven feasts of Israel is what we're noting tonight. And in regard to that, we have the fourth feast, which is the Feast of Pentecost. This was the last of the spring feasts, as we've noted. <clears throat> Jesus Christ fulfilled uh, the spring feast, the fourth spring feast in his first advent. He will fulfill uh, the final three feasts, the fall feasts, in his second coming, starting with the rapture of the church, then with his second advent, and then the beginning of the millennial reign. In regard to this fourth feast, we've noted the Feast of Weeks. It is the Feast of Shavat, according to the Hebrew word. Pentecost is the New Testament word that is uh, given that does mean uh, 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 seven weeks, as it were. And that's basically what we have here, the Feast of Weeks. It would account seven weeks, 49 days. And then on the next day, the 50th, that would be the Feast of Pentecost, and again, Pentecost meaning 50th, so uh, where we get the word penta from. So in any case, this was also called a feast of first fruits, but as we've noted, this is the second of the first fruits festivals that they had in the springtime. 
the Feast of First Fruits at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, celebrated the barley harvest, the first grain uh, to be harvested. This one celebrates the wheat harvest that then would occur around our first week in June in our current day calendar. Shavan uh, or Savan is the uh, Hebrew month that this feast would be participated in. So in Leviticus chapter 23, in verses 15 through 21, we have the feast of uh, first fruits, as it were, that is called Pentecost, but again, the second of the first fruits festivals. So let's go back there and let's just read this once again. Then I'm going to come back and tonight we're going to wrap it up with a lot of the analogy that I mentioned in our first reading of this passage. So in verse 15, you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, and that was the Sabbath of the Feast of First Fruits, okay? Because that was what was just given in verses 9 through 14. That was the Sabbath that uh, Jesus Christ was resurrected on. All right? So from that, from the day when you brought in the sheaf of the wave offering, which is what they did on that Feast of First Fruits uh, at Jesus' resurrection, there shall be seven complete Sabbaths. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring in from your dwelling places two loaves of bread for a wave offering made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. And again, anytime there, you're, you're uh, having these types of festivals or uh, harvest, as it were, they would take the first fruits of what they would harvest. Rather than eating it themselves, they wouldn't eat of the harvest until they presented the first fruits to God. And that's why when we give our offerings on Sunday, I sometimes give that analogy of your first fruits. Because we should have the attitude that of the first of all that God gives to us, we are giving back the first to Him, and then the rest we can enjoy okay and so that's what this first fruits to the lord is all about now in verse 18 it says along with the bread you shall present seven one-year-old male lambs without defect and a bull of the herd and two rams and they are to be burnt offerings to the lord with their grain offering with their libations and offering by fire of a soothing aroma to the lord you shall also offer one male goat for a sin offering and two male lambs, one year old, for a sacrifice of peace offerings. The priest shall then wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering uh, with two lambs before the Lord. They are to be holy to the Lord for the priests. On this day you shall make a proclamation as well. You are to have a holy convocation. You shall do no laborious work. It is to be a perpetual statue in all your dwelling places throughout your generations. And then verse 22, let me just get that in. When you reap the harvest of your land, moreover, you shall not reap the ver uh, to the very corners of your field, nor gather the gleaning of your harvest. You are to leave them for the needy and the alien. I am the Lord your God. All right, so <clears throat> as I mentioned uh, uh, two sessions ago in the first reading of this, a lot of analogy is found here. But the first thing that we take away from all of this, again, is the, the, the number two and the two uh, uh, aspects of the offerings that are given over and over and over again. And remember, that number two does mean division or separation. And in this case, in the positive aspect of separation from the world of sin and Satan's cosmic system being separated unto the Lord. And so that's what this number two is representing. But at the same time, when we look at our fourth seal judgment, we have those two characters of death and Haiti that bring about that judgment onto the world. And so we see the anti-types in the death and Hades compared to the prototypes that we have in this great festival with the types of offerings that they would offer. Because all of these things tell us about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his perfect work in the payment of the penalty of our sins so that we would have salvation, thereby being separated out from the world in sin and entered into unity with God for all 
of eternity. So again, this is the second harvest feast, as I said, the Feast of first fruits. That was the third holiday after the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread. Jesus was resurrected on that day. That's how he fulfilled that first fruits celebration. And that was the barley harvest. And then, as I mentioned before, barley representing the Jewish people. Now we see this harvest of the wheat grain. We see this too as a first fruits uh, celebration, presenting of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. This represents the Gentile peoples and the harvest as a result of Jesus' completed work on the cross, giving both Jew and Gentile opportunity for salvation. So it's the second harvest representing resurrection. We'll see uh, that in a little bit. They were to wave two loaves of bread in this instance. They never did that in any other celebration. In the uh, barley harvest, it was interesting. They just took the sheath, which basically is a basket with the grain in it, and they waved that before God, or even just taking a uh, well, the sheaf would even be the stalk and all of that uh, with the uh, kernels uh, uh, butted on it. And they would wave that whole thing before they even processed any of it. But this one was harvested, uh, 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 winnowed, uh, and also then ground down, made into bread. And then they would present that to the Lord. So again, I won't get into, if I did all that detail, I'd be here for another night uh, doing this. So I'm not getting into all that detail, but all of that has analogy, okay? But it all talks about now, not just taking the wheat, you know, uh, uh, off the shaft, as it were, okay? But now it is fine-tuned and it is processed. Then now they are presenting it to the Lord. So again, we see the signification. All the work of the cross had been completed, including the resurrection of Jesus Christ that demonstrated the victory over sin and death. Now we get to a point where the whole process has been completed. Now we can just focus on the harvest. Now we can focus on this new type of festival and a new type of celebration where it culminates all that work to come together to make something important. So with that, again, the two loaves of wheat, again, made up of two tenths of an ephah of fine flour. So not only did they harvest it, they winnowed it, they separated the wheat from the chaff. They ground it down. Then they had to bake it and mix it with oil and uh, uh, water, whatever they would do to mix it to make the bread and the loaves. And they also put leaven into this one as well. Uh, that, as we understand, leaven is what we call yeast today. And in the Bible, leaven represents sin. So this bread had a representation of the sin nature inside of it. But yet it was presented to the Lord. So once again, it represents humanity and how we are being presented to the Lord as a great harvest based on the completed work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so again, we see this in uh, these passages. And in regard to these loaves of bread, we also see it representing Jesus Christ in hypostatic union. We see the two becoming one. We see the completion of that process of making a full loaf of bread and not just taking the wheat by itself, but now having a loaf of bread, mixing the leaven into it that speaks of Jesus Christ in his hypostatic union, taking on sin into his humanity. So again, you see the representation of Jesus there, taking on the sins of the entire world and being a perfectly satisfying sacrifice to God the Father. And that's what we call the doctrine of propitiation that the work of Jesus Christ on the cross was completely satisfying the righteousness and justice of God, the holiness. Remember, we talked about that the last week. It, it, uh, God's holiness was completely satisfied in the perfect work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. And at this uh, feast, as we've noted, uh, the priest presented loaves, not sheaves of grain, something very different. We're not just taking the raw kernels. We're now taking it, processing it through, and now, once it is completed into a loaf, we are presenting that unto the Lord. And so again, very, very different rather than just taking the raw kernel and presenting it, but ultimately uh, presenting the whole loaf of bread, representing Jesus Christ, again, working united with God the Holy Spirit to complete the work of salvation on the cross, now to be celebrated in this Feast of Pentecost. Now, also, uh, just to remind you, and again, didn't put this in the notes either, but remember in the tabernacle, 
One of the things, uh, articles that was in the holy place, which is the first room, the back room was the Holy of Holies, that had the Ark of the Covenant. But in the first room called the holy place, they had three articles. They had the golden lampstand with the, that we call the, like the menorah that we have today, okay? The golden lampstand that had representation of God and the Holy Spirit working together. We had an altar of incense that represents the prayers going up that are satisfying and uh, uh, satisfactory to God. And he accepts them in a sweet smelling, soothing aroma. But then they had another table called the table of showbreads. And on that table of showbreads, they had loaves of bread that were on that table. And that table of showbreads was absolutely a representation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his completed work for the sins of mankind. And in there they had 12 loaves, one for the, each tribe of Israel. And basically uh, his, his completely uh, uh, fulfilling and satisfying work for all of the tribe of Israel was represented there. Those loaves were without leaven. Now we see these two loaves as being presented with leaven. Because now we're seeing the completion of the work of taking on our sins upon the cross and that being presented to God the Father. And don't lose the point that throughout the New Testament, Jesus Christ presented himself to the world as what? The bread of life. One of the uh, uh, titles that Jesus Christ gave to himself as he presented himself as the Savior and again as sent by the Father. He is the bread of life, just like the manna in the wilderness, just like the table of showbreads, just like the two wave offerings of these two loaves of breads, all representing the perfect completed work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. But these with leaven to represent the taking on of our sins that was provided for all of mankind and united now with mankind all by the power of God the Holy Spirit. Because remember, when we talked about positional sanctification and the seven results of the baptism of God the Holy Spirit, what does the Holy Spirit do? He enters us into union with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the two become one. That's what the whole marriage ceremony is all about, our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, the two becoming one. So in fact, when we look at these loaves of bread, not only does it represent Jesus taking on our sin at the cross, but it also represents the continued processing of the flour and the baking and all that goes into that to make loaves of bread. We now, too, are united in that loaf of bread. All of mankind, Jew and Gentile alike, in the completed work of Jesus Christ. So these loaves of bread have much analogy associated with them. Jesus by himself, the Jews and the Gentiles by themselves, but also more importantly, us believers united with the Lord Jesus Christ based on the baptism of God the Holy Spirit. As I said, Jews and Gentiles alike, baptized into one body. That's what we call the church. There's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. We are all now one in Christ. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 13. I'll read that in just a minute. Basically, all based on the fourth of the uh, uh, result of the baptism of God the Holy Spirit. That we are in union with Christ, we have a position with Him, and we stand holy and sanctified before God for all of eternity. That's what these loaves are representing in the entire process of, again, the harvesting, the winnowing, uh, the separating the chaff from the wheat, uh, the grinding of it, and then making it into loaves of bread, adding the other ingredients including leaven, representing our sin coming into the fore. So all of this is a great analogy. In 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 13, verse 12 says, For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. And again, we could, that's a whole other doctrine of the body of Jesus Christ. Some people are the hands, some people are the eyes, some are the nose, some are the ears, uh, etc., etc. We all have a role, but we're all part of the body of Jesus Christ. Then it goes on in verse 13. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free. We were all made to drink of 
one spirit. So no longer is there a Jewish religion and a pagan or Christian religion or some other religion that may be out there, okay? There's not Jews and Christianity. We are now one in Christ, and we should never distinguish ourselves as such. And that's why denominations is something that God is very much against, because we are one body in Christ. And we should not have ever set up denominations within Christianity. And again, I know the history of that and infighting and this and that, and this sect goes off that way, and that sect goes off this way, and every time you see it, a group comes together, and then that one goes off, and then that one goes off, and then that group. They think they've got all the right information. Then they split into groups, and then that one, and they split into groups, and it just goes on and on and on. Well, let's just cut out the whole denominational aspect of it and just say we're part of the body of Christ. And we all have varying responsibilities and authority with a mission and effect that God wants us to have. And we should all just go out there in our local assemblies as they did in the early church. The one in Ephesus, the one in uh, uh, Thyatira, uh, the one down in uh, Crete, the one over in Jerusalem. You know, they're all part of the body of Christ, but yet separate local assemblies that were going forward inside the plan of God. And so therefore, rather than having all these schisms that divide us, we should just be thinking in terms of we are one body in Jesus Christ. And whether we're Jew or Gentile, it does not matter because anyone who believes is a member of the church and a member of the body of Jesus Christ. That's what is represented in these two loaves of bread that were waved before God, the two becoming one and with all the ingredients mixed in and the whole process being completed to make a loaf of bread. The cross and all the resurrection, now the giving of God the Holy Spirit to make us into the one body called the body of Jesus Christ. These two loaves then ca- uh, correlate to the two characters that we've talked about uh, as represented uh, in the fourth seal judgment of death and Hades. But remember, in the fourth seal judgment, there's a sentencing of what? Death. And you see, that's the judgment here. The sentence is a capital punishment of death, as it were. And what's interesting about that? Well, when you go back to the law in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6, remember what God gave to the Israels as part of their law. You can't convict somebody based on one piece of evidence. There have to be two or more witnesses in order to bring about a conviction. Remember the trials that Jesus Christ went through? That was a lot of the problem with that. They couldn't get two people to agree as to what Jesus did wrong, okay? And they really never did, although some people finally lied, as they usually do in the courtroom these days. And they basically said, oh, yeah, yeah, he did this, he did that, he did this other thing, okay? And they said, oh, that's all we need to hear. Let's get him off to the Romans so we can kill him, okay? But in any case, in the law, you need two pieces of evidence to convict somebody of a crime, and especially a crime that has a sentence of capital punishment, which back in the day most of their crimes (laughs) that were egregious, as we call them today, would have a capital punishment associated with them. But in our day and age, oh no, you can't do that. It's cruel and unusual punishment. And we wonder why we have uh, rampant crime and jails filled to the hilt that we can't afford any longer is because we're not abiding by the word of God. Another topic for another day. But in any case, the point is, is that there needs to be two witnesses. And so we see the number two coming back together. Two witnesses to convict. And in order to convict in the sentence of death in the fourth seal judgment, there are two witnesses that will come to the fore as given to us in the word of God. And the first one is what we studied on Sunday, the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit in regard to sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's evidence number one. The ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, making it known to every person who ever steps on planet Earth that there is first a creator and that behind that there is a savior. He makes that known to members of the human race as part of his ministry. That's evidence number one. Evidence number two is the creation itself, that there is a creator. Let's go there quickly. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. We're going to come back to Leviticus in just a minute. Let's turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 1. I know, uh, you know, 
for you know many years I point to this uh, passage over and over and over again. And as of late, it keeps coming up uh, for us uh, by the Holy Spirit time and time again because it speaks to our generation like never before and how we are rejecting God like never before. And our you know, history of what we know, especially in the United States of America, how we are rejecting God and chasing after all the other falsehoods that are out there in the world. And so in Romans chapter 1, uh, going back to verse uh, 19, it says, I'll go back to verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Again, two, of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. That's the convicting ministry of God the Holy Spirit. He is the one that gives them the understanding that they're a sinner and that they need a Savior. Everyone will be without excuse, as we see in the next passage. It says, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power, and divine nature, given to us in three, because that represents the, tr- uh, the, the uh, Trinity and divine perfection. The number three does. Again, invisible attributes, eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Again, so that they are without excuse. And so creation itself is a witness against the unbeliever because there's more than enough evidence just by looking at creation that there is a God creator and then along with the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit, you need a Savior. And God has provided that as well. And so in nature itself, but unfortunately man has just put all kinds of explanation falsely I would say, as to what makes nature tick, how we gut nature, how we gut creation, evolution, and Big Bang theories, and all of this other garbage that is out there in the world. And it does not go back to the the, uh, authority of a creator. It goes back to man just making things up so that they don't have to believe in a creator. And then in verse 21, For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their uh, speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. In other words, they established all kinds of false and pagan gods, and they worshiped them instead of worshiping the one true God. I'll let you go through the rest of this because that gets into the immorality in the hearts of man that we're seeing in our generation like never before, getting worse and worse and worse. And unless we kind of put a curb to that and stop and get back to a place of righteousness, this nation is just going to go down as many other client nations have gone down and under because they have turned away from their God. And as As a result, he lets you go over to the depravity of their mind. He lets them go over to the depravity of their mind and let them think that they get all the right answers. Let them think they've got all the right information about all the garbage and immorality in the world and that they are right and correct, yet they are foolish in their own minds, as he says. But in any case, uh, another topic for another day. But the first aspect is the two witnesses. And so because of the convicting ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, and because of the witness that we see in creation, there is ample evidence so that no one will be without it, with an excuse. No one will be able to stand before God and say, I did not know. I had no idea. Nobody ever told me. Because when they do, or if they do, if they have the gall to do it at that point, because again, they're going to know in the heart of the hearts that uh, they had ample opportunity. But if they have the gall to do it, God's just going to bring out all his witnesses. Did you see the fish in the sea? How do you think they got there? Did you see my Savior on the cross that somebody told you about? How do you think that happened? And he's basically just going to give them evidence after evidence. And he may even review their life. And say, look at all the times that this evidence was provided to you. Look at all the times that you rejected it wholeheartedly. And you are now 
without excuse. So, again, no excuse on uh, anyone's behalf because God's ministry and the common grace ministry of God the Holy Spirit is to provide all the information they need and give them the understanding and discernment that Jesus is their Savior, and if they believe upon him, they would be saved. And it's clear to them. He gives them understanding. Now it's up to them to say, yes, I believe, or no, I reject it. I, I like the things in the world and the uh, theory of evolution or whatever else the case, or I just make my own chart, and there's nothing after this life. All right, so whatever their arrogance is, they will be without excuse. So uh, let's go back to Leviticus chapter <coughs> 23. And now as we focus on verse 18. <clears throat> because in verse 18 it says, Along with the bread you shall present seven one-year-old male lambs without defect and a bull of the herd and two rams. They are to be a burnt offering to the Lord with their grain offering and their libations and offering by fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord. And again, that soothing aroma means he's satisfied and pleased with it. Here, the wheat loaves, again, we are talking about representing the humanity of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for the Gentiles, taking the leaven or the sin into his body and paying the penalty for our sins. And so that's what's represented there. And then the other type of offering is that burnt offering or what we would call the animal offering. So they had a grain offering and they had an animal offering. And we see the analogy in the grain offering. Now in the animal offering, we absolutely see the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as the animal would give its life for the sacrifice uh, and again be the... Uh, the uh, the Passover or holdover until Jesus Christ went to the cross. Again, the animal sacrifice represents Jesus' sacrifice on the cross in the payment of the penalty of our sins, where he gave his spiritual life so that we could live forever. And so again, we see the twos. We see two types of offerings, a grain offering, and then we see the animal sacrifice. And in that animal sacrifice, remember all the detail that I gave you already, but the uh, seven, which is the number of spiritual perfection, uh, one-year-old lamb, the number one is unity, the lamb representing Jesus Christ himself without sin, okay, because it was without defect, but then he took on sin, as you know. The bull of the herd representing the uh, second living creature, giving us the imagery of uh, God's creation once again of the land animals as we've noted the two rams remember we talked about Abraham and how when he sacrificed his son Isaac God provided the sacrifice rather than sacrificing Isaac again God provided a ram in the thicket this is two again two rams a double portion a double emphasis of the sacrifice there double portion of God's provision for both Jew and Gentile all of that's in view. And then we have the burnt offering with the grain offering. Uh, again, we see, uh, uh, as it says, the grain offering with the drink offering or the libation, as it were. Well, what do we do every first Sunday of the month? We take a grain and we take a drink. Okay, We eat the bread, we drink the wine. This was all a prefigure of then what God would leave as the only ritual uh, uh, for the church age. It is to take the bread and the wine in the communion supper called the Eucharist, where we celebrate and memorialize what Jesus has accomplished for us. This celebration was looking forward to what Jesus Christ would do, and it had much more detail in it because they were telling the story of what would be accomplished on the cross. Now that we know what was accomplished on the cross, we just have a small portion of that to remember what he did for us as a memorial until he returns, as you know. So again, the grain and the drink offering represent our Eucharist or our communion supper. An offering by fire, a soothing aroma unto the Lord. Offering by fire, representing judgment, soothing aroma, propitiation of God the Father. 
Now as we turn to verse 19, it says, You shall also offer one male goat for a sin offering and two male lambs, one year old, for a sacrifice of peace offering. So again, in verse 19, we have two categories. And we have two types of sacrifices. One as a sin offering, another as a peace offering. The sin offering has to happen first. Jesus Christ suffered and was sacrificed for our sins. Once that was completed, now we could have peace with God, both Jew and Gentile. He tore down the dividing barrier. Now we could have peace with God. So the sin offering is a fantastic one. As we also note in Leviticus chapter 16, verses 8 through 10, as I mentioned to you, and again, another study for another day, the whole analogy of the scapegoat, the two uh, the two goats that were sacrificed in that scapegoat offering. As it says there, offer a goat on which the lot for the Lord fell and make a sin offering. And then it says in verse 10, but the goat on which the lot for the scapegoat fell shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it, to send it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. One gave its life, one went three, uh, free. That also reminds us of the trials of Jesus Christ. Remember when Pilate couldn't make a decision? He said, well, it's a holiday. I usually free somebody. I'll take this guy Barnabas, who we know is a convicted killer, proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. You got Barabbas. You got Jesus. Which one do you want? He said Barabbas. Barabbas got to go free. Jesus paid the price. So again, that whole analogy of the scapegoat was played out before their very eyes. And they called for it themselves. Crucify Jesus, give us Barabbas. And God was showing his grace to them by setting what? That sinner murderer and letting him go free. In other words, because the sin would be paid for, anyone who has sin is able to go free when they believe in the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So both of these, the sin offering and the peace offering, both represent the results of the completed work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The sin offering in the process, the result is peace that man can have with God. Again, for those who would believe. Now look at verse 20. In verse 20, the priest shall then wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering with the two lambs before the Lord. They are to be holy to the Lord for the priests. So again, two loaves of bread being waved, two lambs that were sacrificed also being waved. And again, that is just a formal uh, 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 petition and presentation. Here's our offering to you, Lord. This also comes down uh, to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when after his death upon the cross. Remember, his spirit went to be with the Father in heaven. And during that three days that his body was in the grave or in the tomb, his spirit was in heaven. And his spirit went into heaven to present the sacrifice in the true holy of holies in God's throne room, which is in heaven. And Jesus Christ presented himself as the perfect sacrifice during that three day time period. And again, that's what we see in the waving of this, the presentation of the sacrifice. We're giving this to you. We're offering this to you. And that's what Jesus Christ actually did with himself, not only here on earth, but when he went to heaven after his death upon the cross. But what does this represent? The acceptance of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Again, they shall uh, wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering with two lambs before the Lord. They are to be holy to the Lord for the priests. So acceptance of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We're presenting this to you and God is accepting it as a result. And then we see the acceptance of the efficacy for of the sacrifice for all the people. So again, two presentations with two results. One, God being satisfied or propitiated with the sacrifice as it was presented before him. Two, the result of that sacrifice being efficacious for the member of the human race who believes for their salvation. It's an efficacy of the sacrifice. In, in other words, it's effective for our salvation. 
That's what the two aspects of this sacrifice in verse 20, and the waving of the bread and then of the two lambs, as it were. Two and two coming together in these two aspects. Acceptance of the sacrifice, efficacy for the sacrifice, giving salvation to members of the human race. And then uh, they did this with the two lambs, the double sufficiency for God and for man. As it says, they are holy for the Lord. When it mentions holy for the Lord, he was propitiated, perfectly satisfied with the sacrifice. And then for the priest, it was good for the priest. You see, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is good for the priests because the priests now gain salvation as a result. And guess what the believer of the church age is called? Royal priests. You see, we're all a royal priest. We're part of the royal priesthood of God. We have a priesthood because we're a church age believer. We are royal priests because of our union with Jesus Christ, who is royalty as God. And so when it says it is sufficient for God and man, God satisfied with the sacrifice, sufficient for the Lord, but also for the priest. Where then we can receive what we've already studied, the fourth result of the baptism of God, the Holy Spirit, positional sanctification. That it's satisfying and efficacious for our salvation. And as now we are called a body of priests. So we're the royal priesthood, we're royal ambassadors, we're royal priests as we know, and this sacrifice was sufficient for us believers of the church age. So it's kind of interesting how, uh, you know, here we see the sacrifices that God gave to the people of Israel to perform in their faithful walk and worship. He didn't give these to any of the other Gentiles. You see, the Gentiles didn't have to do this, okay, but the Jews did. Now, there would be proselytes if they wanted to convert and come into and, you know, uh, worship and celebrate uh, like the rest. But they didn't have to do these things, okay? The Jews did, though. It was given to them. But it's fascinating how many of the things that the Jews were doing during the age of Israel that speak volumes about the age of the church. That is led by the Gentile, but also made up of Jew and Gentile. And how it is effective for us in this church age when we are now in union with Jesus Christ. So it's absolutely fascinating how God put that together for the Jews, but speaking volumes for our day and age as well. And so, you know, uh, what, we get another week? Uh, what's uh, maybe one, one, this Sunday, the next Sunday, I think might be communion. So hopefully the next time we celebrate our communion supper, there's a whole lot more meaning in that celebration for you now that you understand these sacrifices as we've been uh, explaining and understanding. So, again, propitiating for the Lord, giving positional sanctification for the believer. Then in verse 22, it says, When you reap the harvest of your land, moreover, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field, nor gather the gleaning of your harvest. You are to leave them for the needy, you could say the poor, and the alien, some translate that, foreigners, I am the Lord your God. So we, again, uh, mentioned this aspect as well, another two Two things that they weren't supposed to do in their harvest. Don't get the corners and whatever you drop, uh, drop on the ground, you've got to leave it on the ground. Because why? It's for two people. <laughs> it's for those who are poor amongst you. And again, doesn't say whether they're Jew or Gentile, but also for the foreigners. They, that is the Gentile that comes into your land, and they probably are poor too. So maybe the first one is Jew poor, second one Gentile poor, who knows, okay? But it really doesn't say that. But for the needy, and for the alien, the foreigner who comes in who doesn't have land, doesn't have a farm or own any of that land as of yet because they're not part of the tribe of Israel and they don't have land to provide for themselves. They have need. So here's how I'm going to feed them too. And as I said to you before, this is, and I have got on, on the board as well, this was God, part of God's plan for a welfare program for the poor and the needy, the stranger and the alien. And in this process, he provided for them too. So he provided for those who are of wealth and those who are in need. Those who are of the nation, those who are foreigners to the nation. In other words, for all people, he's providing through these sacrifices in this imagery where the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross is for all the people. The rich and the, and the poor, the great and the small. 
national or the in, uh, international, whatever the case, however you want to put that. He did it for all. Completely perfect sacrifice for all members of the human race. And so in that, remember, their welfare program also uh, allowed for them to go and gather these things for themselves. So they had to do a little work there. They didn't, somebody else didn't pick it up for them and bring it to their home and say, here, just sit at home, do nothing. Here you go, okay? No, they had to go do a little bit of something. And they had to go and gather it. If they wanted to eat, they had to go do a little bit of something. Now, the other aspect of uh, the uh, welfare program in the days of Israel was the indentured servant uh, that we talk about, that also we use the word slave, but very different from the slavery that we think about in the United States of America. Some of that was good slavery, indentured servant type, but other parts were very horrific, as we know, and very much abused as a, a people and as a nation. And we're still paying for that abuse that was done back then today. Again, probably rightly and justly so. But in any case, uh, you know, God provided and God has a means and mode of operation to provide for all the people. Physically and also especially spiritually. So God is there to provide for every member of the human race as the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is perfectly satisfying uh, for all members of the human race as it is accepted by God the Father. And that's why, again, when we read in the great passage of resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, well, let me have you turn there, and uh, we'll kind of close with this, and I'll just get one more point in after that. But let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, go down to verses 20 and 23. <clears throat> when we think about the Feast of first fruits, and we, you know, we've gone down into the, you know, the depths of all the uh, understanding and meaning, and I, guess sh I shouldn't say all because I'm sure there's 10 other things I probably could have talked about during this uh, analogy and whatnot. But if we go back up to the 50,000-foot uh, you know, uh, viewpoint, okay, the main viewpoint of this was all about the two loaves of bread the first uh, wheat harvest of the season, how that represents not only the Jew, but now the Gentile, and the complete sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and the beginning of the church age as we know. But yet it was what? A harvest celebration. As even the fall celebrations, those too are related to the harvest of their time for the fall crops, as these were for the spring crops. And what's the harvest all about? Well, the harvest is about people who believe in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that again will be taken out from the world and entered into the eternal relationship with God and resurrected to eternal glory. That's what these celebrations are truly all about. The resurrection of everyone who would believe, and as we now know, during the church age as well. And that's why we have in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 23 to start, it says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. And again, we saw two first fruit harvests of the barley uh, harvest and of the wheat harvest, one for the Jew, one for the Gentile, just to make sure that they're all categorized and uh, um, identified so that they all know that they're a part of the resurrection. They're all part of the first fruits for the resurrection. So again, from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Now in that case, it's a general, everybody who's resurrected is part of the first fruits of resurrection because of those who are asleep. In other words, the, all the people that are dead, some are going to be raised, some are not going to be raised. The unbelievers aren't going to be raised. But the believers will be raised. That's the first fruits that's in view here in the general macro sense. Now in verse 21. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. And we say the first fruits of the first fruits, because we just read about first fruits in verse 20. All right. But Christ the first fruits, after that those who are in Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers up the kingdom to God and Father, or to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. And so again we see uh, you know, each in his own order. 
And that's when we recognize that there's a different order of resurrection based on the dispensations of human history. And again, another doctrine for another day. But we know that Christ was raised and resurrected first. The next group to be resurrected is you and I, the church, at the end of our church age. Then at the end of the tribulation, all uh, uh, Israel, uh, 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 age of Israel or age of the law saints, okay, all those believers plus the Gentile and Jew believers prior to, well, they weren't Jewish, yeah, they were, before then, okay, <laughs> so all believers up until the cross of Christ, they get resurrected at the end of the tribulation and then at the end of the millennial reign, all of those who die during the millennial reign who are believers, they will be resurrected. So there are actually four groups of resurrection. Jesus Christ first, church age believers second, uh, Old Testament saints, best way to say it, plus tribulational saints or martyrs being resurrected at the second advent, and then finally the millennial saints at the end of the millennial reign. That's the order according to Scripture. Another doctrine for another day. But Christ the first fruits, and then all of us each in our own order. This celebration of Pentecost was a first fruits celebration, recognizing the celebration of the harvest, that Jesus Christ has come into the world, paid for our sins, and anyone who would believe upon him would have everlasting life and receive resurrection with a resurrection body one day and live with God forever and ever in eternity um, forevermore. So that's what this celebration was truly all about, but God also used it as the beginning of of the church age as we know it. When the indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit, came into the disciples in the upper room, as we read about in Acts chapter 2, and began the church age, uh, the church age dispensation, ending the age of, or interrupting the age of Israel, slash the age of the law, interrupting that, and then inserting the church age to make up the body of Jesus Christ, which would be the next group to be resurrected according to the word of God. So let's jump down to the end of chapter 15. As we've read already in verse 54, it says, But when this perishable would have put on imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this celebration was all about that, the victory of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we not only see the sacrifice, but we see the results of the sacrifice called the peace offering that we all receive when we would believe in the Lord. But unfortunately, because the world has rejected the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross in the payment of the penalty of their sin, they have rejected the bread that gives life, the bread of life, according to John chapter 6, verse 33 and 51. Again, because they have rejected that, the world is going to receive these judgments in the tribulational time period, especially the fourth sealed judgment that rightly and justly will bring about this judgment and bring about that capital punishment because of the two convicting uh, 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 witnesses that will uh, render a judgment of death. And so unfortunately, this world will have to experience such a horrific time because they have rejected the perfect work of Jesus Christ on the cross and they've rejected God's provision for eternal life giving them one more opportunity uh, after opportunity after opportunity. He brings in these horrific uh, time periods and judgments, hoping that they will wake up and come to salvation. Many will, whether it's hundreds or thousands or millions. Many will come to uh, salvation during the tribulation, but unfortunately, many also will not. And that's a sad commentary on the human mind and human soul. But God in grace has provided all of this through the cross of Jesus Christ, and he provides the information through the convicting common grace ministry of God the Holy Spirit so that none are without excuse. All right, so let's uh, close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for helping us to understand the great sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross as uh, commemorated within the uh, Levitical feasts that you have given to us. And help us to understand 
And Father, when we celebrate our communion in the upcoming week, we uh, just pray that it, it gives even more meaning to us each and every day as we recognize and understand what your Son has accomplished for us and what your great plan has provided for us each and every day. So Father, we thank you for this time and we ask for travel blessings on our way home. In Christ's name, amen. All right, thank you very much. If there's any questions, let me know.